What is going on, Ape Nation? Well, all things must eventually come to an end. And unfortunately, this long-ass series that I've been playing on my channel with Gary Gensler testifying before Congress is finally coming to an end because this is going to be the last episode of it. Now, today we're going to hear about whistleblowers and what happens when a whistleblower doesn't get his award money. Boo. Frickin' who. We need more whistleblowers, they say. We need to pay these whistleblowers. We need to come up with money or change some laws to make sure these whistleblowers get paid. Well, what about the apes' money? Do they not care about that? Or is it just that this episode doesn't address that? I don't know. You'll have to find out. Uh, we're also going to be talking about or hearing about China. And last but not least, you're also going to hear about what Gary Gensler believes to be the greatest systemic risk to financial stability. So I hope that you stay tuned for all that. We will get started right away. But before we do, please go ahead and smash that like button so that the YouTube algorithm shares this with as many apes as possible. And of course, if you're new here, if you haven't subscribed yet, make sure that you do because I drop content just like this every single day. Let me start by thanking you for your efforts to move forward on a rulemaking on uh, 10B5-1 uh, uh, plans. Uh, Senator Fisher and I had bipartisan legislation that would have directed the uh, SEC uh, to look at this because you know well that uh, public confidence in the markets requires uh, confidence that there's not insider trading, and I look forward to your rulemaking uh, in that regard. Uh, I just want to try and cover a couple other points. Um, one involves the whistleblower provisions. As you know, we have whistleblower laws designed to encourage individuals to surface cases of fraud. Um, and beginning in 2010, a Marylander, uh, John McPherson, um, who's a former forensics accountant, gave the SEC what the SEC described as, quote, extraordinary and continuing, unquote, assistance. Uh, that helped the agency shut down a $1.4 billion investment scam uh, by a company called Life Partners Holdings, Inc. Uh, despite his substantial assistance, Mr. McPherson did not receive the whistleblower award because uh, the company went bankrupt, uh, and as a result, the SEC did not collect its fine. But the case did require over $8 billion for investors, as you know, in bankruptcy, all the lawyers and accountants got paid. But the person who was the most instrumental in bringing this case to light and exposing the fraud did not receive his whistleblower award. So I want to work with you in the SEC to see if you can, through your existing authorities, make sure that um, he gets what would normally be expected in this case, or if a change in law is required uh, to work with us. because. I think you would agree, would you not, that we do want to continue to incentivize people to bring these cases to light? Uh, uh, Senator, I agree wholeheartedly. I know the work that Senator Grassley did to bring this whistleblower uh, regime into place. Uh, the SEC to date has had a, a really robust whistleblower program, and it's helped the American public and the investors public. Um, but I look forward to working with your office on this matter. Right. I mean, this kind of situation, obviously, uh, may discourage people from coming forward at great risk potentially to themselves um, if at the end of the day. What I don't know yet is whether it will need a change in law rather than something in our current authority. That's what we're exploring now with your, your team, but uh, look forward to continuing to do that. Um, so turning to um, Didi, um, in July following the collapse of the share prices of, the, of Didi, um, I urged uh, the SEC to thoroughly investigate the incident to see if uh, investors were intentionally misled by Didi's public disclosures. As you know, that collapse in share price came shortly after, uh, after that happened. Um, I know you can't disclose whether there's an ongoing investigation, I, and I, I commend uh, you for the statements you've made generally about reviewing uh, listings of Chinese uh, companies on the U.S. exchanges. Can you expand on that? And I, I uh, heard Senator Kennedy uh, also reference your op-ed piece uh, in the Wall Street Journal uh, regarding implementation of the legislation that he and I uh, introduced on um, holding companies responsible uh, to ensure that uh, we're, we're allowed to see their books through an independent um, entity to protect American uh, shareholders 
and investors. Can you just talk uh, about both those pieces of uh, the need to better protect American investors? So, so there's about uh, 270 Chinese-related companies in our capital markets, uh, between one and a half and two trillion dollars to give you a sense of scope and scale. But many of these actually, the U.S. cannot invest directly. See, in China, they prohibit foreign ownership in the internet and telecom and other fields. So there's been a form of setting up a shell company in the Cayman Islands. That Cayman Islands company raises money in the U.S., and it has some operating arrangements with the Chinese company, which, by the way, usually is still owned. So I, I sort of got to the SEC. You all have passed the Holding Foreign Companies Accountable Act. I think there's those two issues. One is after 19 years after Sarbanes-Oxley, Chair Sarbanes sitting in this chair in this room, passed and our good friend, our Maryland uh, mentor, uh, I consider a mentor, um, uh, passed that bipartisan bill, 50-plus jurisdictions have complied and two have not. China and Hong Kong. So Congress on a bipartisan basis again said, let's, let's address that. We've got three years. We've had discussions directly with the Chinese authorities. The clock is ticking. But I also think in the meantime, in the meantime, we should enhance the disclosures of the existing companies, these 200 plus companies, uh, as to the political risk, the regulatory risk, and the real financials between China and the Cayman Islands. The COVID-19 pandemic uh, has presented the most immediate and ongoing threat to the U.S. economy and the global economy of the last two years. Uh, but beyond the risks presented by the pandemic, Chairman Gensler, as a voting member of the Financial Stability Oversight Council and in your capacity as SEC chair, can you please provide to this committee your assessment of the greatest systemic risks to financial stability in the United States? Um, we work together at the Financial Stability Oversight Council on an annual report, and we're sort of in the, in the midst of that right now. Um, and uh, I think that systemic risk issues, uh, something that could spill over into the whole marketplace, though our capital markets have weathered the storm of this pandemic and actually weathered, I think, better than it would have because of the reforms of Dodd-Frank and the greater capital in the system, um, there's still risk in the system, whether it's in the commercial real estate area, uh, the, the, uh, the reach for yield that uh, a second area I'm mentioning is a reach for yield that uh, many investors, not just retail investors, but investors uh, more broadly are reaching for yield. Um, we in our, in our uh, country are also transitioning off of something that created systemic risk in the past called the London Interbank Offer Rate and the transition away from LIBOR to another set of rates uh, is, I think, being managed well, but it still presents some risk in that transition because there's two to three hundred trillion dollars of assets uh, on top of that. But I'd say the biggest risk is the healthcare risk itself. And the healthcare risk and how that's managed as a nation, and the economic risk associated with that are probably the biggest risks. You have a three part mission, uh, Mr. Chairman, to protect investors, to maintain fair, orderly, and efficient markets, and to facilitate capital formation. Could you please uh, inform the committee how you view climate change uh, as impacting that three part mission and the actions you're going to take? in order to protect investors, maintain fair, orderly, and efficient markets, and facilitate capital formation given the projections of significant negative impacts from climate change? I think that uh, we're, we're taking up two uh, initiatives, and I think both of them relate to all three of the pieces. I think investors increasingly want to know about the climate risk of their uh, companies they own, and I think by bringing consistent, comparable information and standards into this that the, the companies themselves will benefit. The companies will benefit because they'll say, ah, now we can, we can compete efficiently in the capital markets by presenting uh, this set of standards around their greenhouse gas emissions and around their uh, management of climate risk. So, um, the second docket is around uh, the fund management side, and if they're uh, saying that they're uh, green or sustainable or carbon-free, what stands behind that? But again, I think that that helps investors make decisions and companies raise money. So I think it helps all three of our mission points. 
returning to the question of systemic risk uh, and financial stability, in recent testimony before this committee, the Fed chair testified about his concerns regarding money market funds and treasury markets, the performance of money market funds uh, during conditions of financial stress in March of 2020 requiring federal intervention. And he testified regarding treasury markets, quote, that at that time, the treasury market really lost functionality. The most important financial market lost functionality significantly during the acute phase of the crisis, that being the initial onslaught of COVID-19. Do you share the Fed chairman's assessment and concerns regarding money market funds and uh, treasury markets? I, I thank you for reminding me to your earlier question. I should have said the treasury market itself is, is, is does present uh, the functioning of that market, some systemic risks. Three times, October 14, this fall of 19, and the spring of 20, we had more than hiccups inside the Treasury market. And it's about the structuring of that market. And so working with Secretary Yellen, Chair Powell, even uh, Acting Chair Benham, uh, I, I would hope we can bring more resilience through central clearing in that market and also uh, bringing the principal trading firms, the high frequency trading firms into that remit. Uh, to your other question about money market and open end funds, we do have that on our docket as uh, ranking member Toomey asked earlier, we do hope to do that, uh, I'd say maybe by Q1 of the year to address money market funds around uh, the connection between the um, liquidity provided and, and what's called gates, but also to look at the liquidity rules themselves uh, in that uh, market as well as open-end bond funds.